So now, um, how is this actually useful? This is actually very, very useful. It helps us for a lot of things. So actually, I'm just going to continue on here. So impulse. So it's useful for, uh, well, let's see here. Um, we can say forces applied over a certain time. You see, if we have a force that's being applied uh, in some given time, then we can actually use this really well. It can use things like, um, oh, I don't know. I mean, we can actually use it in rock climbing. It turns out if we're going rock climbing, um, this is just a use that I have at least. So I've got, uh, let's say if I'm out climbing with my friends here. So let's just say I'm out there and I'm climbing. And so here's me and I've just fallen. So thankfully I have my rope with me. So here's me and I'm tied to some sort of rope above me here. Now I'm falling down. Okay, so my, you know, my velocity is going downwards. Well, I want my rope to basically stop me from falling. So if you look at this, we have the impulse is equal to F delta T, which is also equal to M delta V. So what I can do then is if I'm in the middle of, you know, of falling, there's a reason why I want a certain type of rope. And I'm going to show you that actually. So if you're climbing, you can get what's called a static rope or you can get a dynamic rope. Now the rope that I want to use to stop me from falling, I want what's called a dynamic rope. And that's because... Um, well, actually, I'll explain that. So right here, what I want to do is I want to look at the force that's going to be applied onto me, but also onto the rope. Because you see, if there's too much force on the rope, it'll either break the rope or it will break my back. And neither of them is uh, wanted. So I want to minimize this force. So what if I just solve for this force? I say F um, and I want to get the force by itself. Turns out I'm going to ignore the impulse, even though I'm using the equation for it, but I'm going to use F delta T equals M delta V. If I want to get F by itself, then I have to divide by delta T. So I could say it's going to be M delta V over delta T. There's the vector parts here. That means a smaller delta T uh, leads to larger force. Just like a smaller, oops, sorry, uh, just like a larger delta T leads to a smaller force. Now this is what I want. I want to reduce the force. So it turns out if I make the delta T bigger, if I make the, the, the time larger here, dividing something by a larger number means this is smaller. You can always try it, right? Divide by 5 or divide by 6 or divide by 7 or divide by 8. And you'll see that the, this value right here actually becomes uh, smaller as you get larger values of time. Well, that's exactly why we want what's called a dynamic rope. See, what we want here, in a rope at least, we want this. We want to have a larger delta t. In other words, we want the time that we apply the force onto the rope. We want it to be a larger time. So having a stretchy rope... That will help because if the rope stretches a little bit, then you apply the force over a larger time. And that means then that you end up with a smaller force. So that's really nice. That's why at least in rock climbing, this is really useful. Um, I mean, just other uses that I like to think about. Well, uh, rocket engines. It turns out that if you have a rocket engine, it's all about applying a force over a time. In fact, we have a word that we call specific impulse. That's actually a very common word. Almost anybody who's in uh, rocket design will actually know. So if you're a rocket scientist, you know lots about specific impulse. <clears throat> and that tells you what kind of force per unit time that um, some sort of engine can give off. Turns out the word specific means something special. But uh, I mean, we have these words called specific impulse. There's even things called, uh, well, impulse drives, not only in science fiction, but it turns out in science fact, we have things like ion impulse drives. So some of that stuff sounds really neat, but impulse is very useful, not only for collisions, um, but also for rock climbing, rocket engines, whatever else. So I'm going to give you an example here. So I thought, well, okay, I kick a ball and the mass is 0.5 kilograms and the ball is initially at rest. Now, how fast will it be going after I've kicked it? 
Okay, so here's me and I'm just kicking the ball, right? I mean, there's nothing really that complicated going on. I basically kick the ball. So the ball just, you know, initially it's at rest and finally it's got some movement. So it has the following force versus time graph. So you're given that the force applied onto the ball over a given time, well, you can see at time t equals zero seconds, there's no force being given to it. All of a sudden here, I start to apply a force here. This is, this is the act of me kicking it. So my actual kicking only lasted this long. So kick lasted, well, how long is this? Uh, let's see, the kick lasted, well, from 0.1 to 0.3, that's, uh, well, 0.3 minus 0.1 is 0 0.2. So I've got, and my kick lasted only 0.2 seconds. During that time, I applied a force of, well, some force, a larger force, larger force, up until a maximum force of 20 newtons. Okay, so that was my maximum force here. The maximum that I gave it was 20 newtons, although I did give it less, right? I mean, I started off by giving it, well, 0 0.01 newtons, 0 0.02, all the way up to, you know, 10 newtons, then all the way up to 15, all the way up to 20, and then back down. This is somewhat more realistic, at least, um, because you apply a force over a given time. Now, it doesn't have to be straight lines. It can be curves. It can be whatever. But if I want to know how fast it will be going, I could probably use this equation for impulse. And it says that impulse is F delta T equals M delta V. I'm just writing it again. So if that's the case, well, um, the impulse necessarily, it, it isn't necessarily important to find this impulse here. But let's look at what we can do with this graph. And I alluded to this before, saying that, well, if we look at this graph, we can only do three things with it, really. Um, well, we can do lots more than that, but we could find a y-intercept, we could find a slope, or we could find the area underneath it. Which one is useful? Well, the area underneath this one is the only one that's useful because I want to do these things times these things, because the area of something is length times a width. So in this case, I've got f times delta t, so aha, the area will equal f delta t. This is going to be important. You see, from this graph, I can tell the area of this. Yeah, I can I can find this area right here. Now what's that area? Let's see. This area is going to be, well, height times the width divided by two, because the area of a triangle is equal to just base times height divided by two. That's sort of a nice easy way to remember things for triangles at least. The area of a triangle is the base times the height divided by two. So the base here in this case, then the area is going to equal, well, the base is 0 0.2 seconds wide, and the height is 20 newtons. And if I multiply those, well, 0 0.2 times 20, we could actually figure that out. But actually, I don't want to just stop there. I want to say this, that the area equals F delta T, but look carefully, it also equals M delta V. So I just want to keep going. So the area is F delta T, which is M delta V. Therefore, the area is, well, the area is this right here, which that right there equals, um, then I have my M delta V here. I don't know if that makes any sense. I'm just filling it out. So I've got my force times my change in time. Of course, I had to divide that by two, didn't I? That was really important here. So then my area is the base times the height divided by two. Now what if I just wanted to figure out this value right here? What is this? I don't need a calculator for it. Turns out I can do 20 divided by two, that's just gonna be 10, and 10 times 0.2 is just two. So that means I know that F delta T equals two, and uh, I was a little bit sloppy with my units here. These had units of seconds, these had units of newtons. So it's two newton seconds. So that's useful, but I'm not done yet. Remember though, I can set that equal to M delta V. So that means I know then that two equals m delta v. And if I want delta v then, delta v is just gonna be two divided by um, my mass. So if I have this right here, well I have two divided by, and what's the mass of the ball? It's 0 0.5. So then I can say, well, two divided by 0 0.5, that's just gonna be four. That's gonna be four meters per second. So that's my change in velocity. So if I had a certain starting velocity, well, I would know that my final velocity is four meters per second more than I started with. OK, 
Okay, that's how it is in general here. That's my change in velocity here. However, what I can say then is, well, I was a little bit sloppy here again, because uh, what I should have done is told you the direction that I traveled, but that's okay. We can say it's four meters per second. I did ask how fast is it going? I didn't say what is its velocity. To know velocity, I would need to know the direction. So I could have said, I kick it east. Well, then this would be east. But keep in mind, because my initial speed was zero, because it was initially at rest, well, zero plus four meters per second is still four meters per second. Um, or I could say, in other words, four meters per second minus zero. You know, that's how we do a change in something. We do the end minus the first. And if that's the case, then this is the speed of the ball. So it initially was going zero meters per second. It was initially at rest. That's the key thing here. Um, and finally, it's going four meters per second. So that's how we can at least use something that may look really complicated and with a weirdo looking graph. And we can use our nice equation for impulse. It turns out this right here is also the change in momentum. So I could have been asked that. I could have been asked, what's the change in momentum on the ball? Well, that would be the same idea as just find m delta v. But if I wanted m delta v, it's the same thing as f delta t. In other words, see this two, uh, whoops, this f delta t here, this two newton seconds, that's the change in momentum. So if I was asked for the change in momentum of this ball, I would say, oh, it's simply two newton seconds. But I wanted to go a little bit further. I wanted to know how fast is it going at the end. So we had to use this two newton seconds to actually work forward and figure out that it was four meters per second. So that's how we can deal with some uh, basic definitions about momentum and some specifics with impulse.